So it's, um, it's a, a great pleasure to be able to welcome a visiting speaker and especially Deva Mitra, who is a long established order member. I think you said 48 years you've been ordained? Yeah. Goodness. <laughs> um, so I, I first met Deva Mitra when, in 1980, I think it was, when we were both living in the London Buddhist Centre in Sukhavati. Um, and we would sometimes meet at classes. And I think the next time we met was actually <coughs> in Shrewsbury. Uh, you have you visited quite a number of times when mm. you were living in Birmingham. Um, and um, David Mitra has visited this Sangha when we were meeting in the Quaker Meeting House. Um, I think it's fair to say that you, you've had a long and varied career <laughs> in Tri Ratna, uh, which <laughs> involves being um, Mitra convener. Is that, was that worldwide? Yeah. It was worldwide Mitra convener for quite a while. Lived at Majama Loka in Birmingham, with where Banti was living for 18, 17 or 18 years, I think. I lived there 18 years. 18 <laughs> years, yeah. And has been um, president of, uh, four, I think it was four centres. So a very wide range of experience in, and he's still working, uh, taking meditation classes in the lockdowns. Um, and anyway, he will let you know himself what he's, what he's currently engaged in. I don't have to give his life history. No. Okay. So um, it's been a particular pleasure and privilege for me to be able to offer Deva Mitra um, accommodation for this evening. Um, I haven't spoken to him about this, so this is going to be a, a, a bit of uh, a surprise to him. I have not enjoyed the best relationship with Deva Mitra. <laughs> Um, and I was, I was, a, I can't remember, I don't know what the word is, trepidatious, is that, is that a word? <laughs> um, uh, about uh, meeting him and about him staying. But I must say, it's been a real pleasure and privilege. It feels like I've met you for the first time, really. Okay. And it's been a real pleasure. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, right. I'm getting all emotional now, so I'll stop. So, uh, what we're going to do this evening is um, I'm going to, I think I'll move away and leave you with, with Dave Mitra. He's going to talk, uh, give a talk for about half an hour, 40 minutes. Uh, there'll be time for a few questions and answers after that. We'll have a tea break at half past eight and then we'll come back and I'll lead a meditation about just before nine o'clock until half past nine. Over to you, David. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Well, thank you for that uh, that introduction, Jayaratna. I hasten to add that when Jayaratna didn't always have find me easy around the LBC, the London Buddhist Centre, where I was at that time. I was popularly known as Ayatollah Deva Mitra. <laughs> <laughs> it was not meant to flatter. Um, and uh, actually, I, I, uh, I, I, watched, I very foolishly watched uh, a talk recently that I'd given in, it must have been in somewhere in the mid to late 80s. I just, one of those things I stumbled across on the internet. And, uh, I watched about the first 10 minutes. It was this at Pabaloka. Bhante had introduced me and others. It was part of the symposium. And I was, I just couldn't stand it after 10 minutes. I thought, no wonder they used to react. Um, <laughs> I mentioned this to Sabuti, who's a very dear friend of mine. We've known each other since we were both 24. So <laughs> he just looked at me puzzled and said, David Mitra, I wouldn't dare watch one of my early talks. <laughs> what on earth made you do it? <laughs> Curiosity, I suppose, anyway. I've got no ambition to see any other of my early talks. Um, one of the miracles of the Dharma, um, in fact, the miracle of the Dharma really, is that people can change, and even I've changed. 
I'm no longer called Ayatollah Dead Mitra around the LBC. Um, I don't know that I have any nickname particularly, or I might have for all I know, but um, <laughs> I don't believe so. Uh, certainly not such an unpleasant one as that. Anyway, yes, I'm very, very pleased to be back here in Shrewsbury because when I first came with Sangadeva many years ago, uh, as Jaratna mentioned, uh, the meetings took place in the Friends Meeting House, and it was a very small group then. Um, and uh, the dream of having the Shrewsbury Buddhist Centre was a very distant one, as far as I was aware anyway, if it existed at all. Uh, but now here it is in reality, and it's well, such a lovely room you've got here, um, and so big. You've got to fill it. I mean, like, you know, really fill it. Um, you can get four, probably four or five times as many people in, in this room as you've got at the moment, easily. Anyway, that's uh, your ambition for the future, no doubt. Uh, but yes, I'm very, very pleased to be here. Um, so as you're probably aware, I'm going to be talking about, um, well, I'm going to introduce a book that I've written recently, but uh, what I really want to do is to talk about um, uh, about themes that have arisen out of that book, or themes that were in my mind when I was writing, because I wrote this book, most of it actually, not, not all of it, most of it, when I was going through the hardcore treatments of cancer, chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Um, and then I sort of, you know, I kept it going for a while until I thought, no, that's enough, leave it behind. Um, I would never have published it had it not been for Sabuti, but he said, look, you must publish your, well, make your, your cancer writings more widely known, because he knew of one woman in India who'd found um, a great source of inspiration. She's a woman with cancer. Um, so that spurred me on, and uh, fortunately, Windhorse Publications agreed to publish, and it's now, it's been, well, it was published earlier this year, in February. Um, but, so that's why I'm here. But um, thinking about the themes in my book, and um, what I might say this evening, and what I, I tend to say, well, I, I follow the, the more or less the same themes wherever I go, but they all, always come out differently. But one of the things that has always struck me throughout my life, actually, is the fact that <coughs> a young, the young Prince Siddhartha, um, at a very early age, I mean, he, he's traditionally described as go forth at the age of 29, but if you look at the very early texts, it suggests a much younger man than that. Uh, in fact, the, the earliest account we have, which is in the Sutta Nipata, uh, describes him as a youth. And, you know, if you're 29, you're no longer a youth. Uh, I, I don't think I'm offending anyone this evening, <laughs> as far as I can tell. Uh, but, um, um, you know, you're no longer a youth if you're 29. Uh, you're you know, really, if you're a youth, you're probably in your late teens. Um, so there's quite a likelihood that he went forth at a very early age. He left home in order to pursue the life of a wanderer in pursuit of the truth. And he did so because he'd seen the four sights, which I imagine many of you will, will be familiar with. Um, the sight of... Uh, uh, an old person, uh, some, a sick person, and a dead person, a dead body. And seemingly he'd not seen these before. There was a fourth sight, which of course is the homeless wanderer, uh, which represents something completely differently. But what really has struck me always about this story is the fact that at such a young age he could see that he was going to be affected by old age, sickness and death. Uh, that one day he too would grow old. One day he too would get sick. One day he too would die. And that was the spur to him leaving home in pursuit of enlightenment or the ultimate truth, uh, seeing, you know, the desire to see into the true nature of things. And the fact that he was able to be inspired to do that at such a young age, and I mean, as far as I'm, I know, there's some scholarly dispute about this, but it you know, that there's plenty of, um, uh, I think there's very good reason to believe that he, did, he, that he didn't actually believe, leave her home when he was 29, but much, much younger. Uh, but even so, even at 29, even when you're still in your 20s, to see these things and to be moved by them to the extent that you realise that they're going to affect you, uh, that they're going to impact upon your life and not become depressed about it. 
And that's quite remarkable. Uh, because, he, of course, he didn't. He saw the fourth sight. He saw the significance of the fourth sight. Uh, the significance of, well, there must be something beyond this. There is even something beyond this. Um, and, of course, he went on over quite a long period, probably, to realise that and eventually became the Buddha, uh, the, the fully enlightened one. So, if I compare myself to the young Prince Siddhartha, uh, I certainly didn't have much insight into those things when I was younger. I think until I was diagnosed with high blood pressure when I was 67, I thought probably I was pretty untouchable. You know, I never had any serious health issue in the course of my life until I was 67. That's pretty good. That's pretty good sort of, um, pretty pretty good run really. Uh, but then, of course, 18 months later, I was diagnosed with cancer, and that's when it really drove home hard. Yes, old age, sickness, and death. And of course, also, I realised I really was beginning to get old. Um, it's hard in your 60s because you don't quite want to admit it. I don't know if anyone's in their sixties at the moment, present, but either here or online. But um, um, you know, it took me quite a while to sort of accept that I really was getting old. Uh, but uh, the cancer diagnosis certainly brought that home to me. And as soon as I was diagnosed, I took it in the spirit of a challenge. I knew that it was not going to be easy. I knew that it was going to be, I would have to go through some quite grueling treatments. And um, that was not, it, it would, it would, it would um, test me severely, which it did. But I have spent most of my life practicing Dharma. Uh, the, well, certainly from the age of 24, no matter how um, uh, over enthusiastically and insensitively I did that when I was younger, <laughs> I, I, I admit quite freely I was pretty insensitive. Uh, I've seen the evidence. <laughs> I've had enough complaints over the years. Uh, but one does eventually sort of learn to become a bit more emotionally positive, uh, less prone to irritability, less prone to um, impatience and so forth. And one can change. One can really change. So I've been practicing Dharma for all that time, for close on 50 years now. Uh, in fact, this is, a, this is the 50th anniversary of my contact with the Dharma, really. Uh, certainly as a practitioner. And almost from the beginning, it, I, it became, it, it was placed right at the heart of my life. But uh, one of the things that I frequently have to remind my young friends at the London Buddhist Centre uh, about is that you, know, you have to be patient with this process. Uh, by the way, I live in a men's community and the, the <coughs> next youngest member of my community is half my age. I'm 74. And um, they, so they're all in their 20s or early 30s, uh, apart from two who are in their mid-30s now, the old men of the community. They get, yeah. they're, they're getting worried about, well, one of them is anyway, gets, frequently gets worried about the, the number of grey hairs that are appearing on his head. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, I should say, well, come on, these are just messengers of death. <laughs> but, uh, well, they are really, aren't they? The fact that they're, they're messengers, they're telling you that you're getting older. Mm. Um, but... Um, um, what was I say? I've lost my thread completely now. Don't worry, I'll come back. Um, we'll find our way through. Um, yes, you, if you practice the Dharma, you've really got to be patient. Well, at least I have had to be patient. Because, um, uh, you know, it's a bit like you, you take up the practice of meditation and you may think that you're, that you're getting nowhere. Uh, and you have expectations which are not met. Um, and it's very easy to become disheartened by that. But um, I think it took me until I was in my 60s to realise that actually, well, I knew I'd changed, I knew I'd changed for the better, but looking back over 40 odd years at that point, I realised that the changes that had taken place in me were quite significant. But they'd taken a very, very long time to become obvious to me, at least, even though my friends seem to think that. I obviously had changed, but um, when you're in the midst of something, um, you can't always see what's going on. I mean, for an, uh, an example of this for me was I did a nine-month solitary retreat on one occasion, and um, uh, the first thing I said when I came out of that retreat to 
the order member who was running the community at Kuhileka, where I was, or at least who was the sort of um, the, the chair of the the the, the, um, the the charity there, I said to him, I think I just wasted the last nine months of my life. And he just laughed. I said, I don't think so, Dave Mitra. Uh, but in me, as soon as I came out of that retreat, it wasn't obvious to me that much had happened. And I think the reason for that is that, you know, you, you, you're there, sort of hour by hour, day by day, week by week, month by month. And it always seems the same. You know, there's, it's, it's, you, there's not much happens, seemingly. I mean, occasionally something dramatic happens, but really not that often. Uh, but um, so at the end of that process, it's not obvious that you know you're very different at the end of that process than you were at the beginning. I did eventually realise that something had happened. Quite apart from the fact that my friends were saying, "You seem so much more relaxed than in intro." <laughs> uh, but um, it became, it, it did become apparent to me. It began to become apparent to me after a few days. And then after a few weeks, I was quite clear that something very significant had happened. And I think it's like that with one's overall practice of the Dharma, that you have to be patient with it and not expect too much. Um, if you're lucky, sometimes something quite spectacular might happen when you're meditating, or maybe not. Um, but um, in a way, that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is to keep applying yourself to practices and just... You know, don't worry too much about it in a way. Um, but all actions have consequences. Uh, this is a basic principle of, of the Dharma. Um, and when, when we, if we think, for instance, of, ex of meditation specifically, well, that's quite a powerful action because you're working with your mind. It's, a, it's an action of mind. And actions of mind are the most important. They're the most sort of... Um, uh, profound. I mean, what goes on in the mind determines our external behaviour, of course. Um, but, um, you know, these changes that take place are very subtle and very gradual. I, <clears throat> last summer, did something which I was deeply ashamed of, just to make a point, um, which was that um, I very foolishly stopped the young man who was, he's, actually he was a youth, he was a young man, who was riding um, on his uh, motocross motorbikes in Victoria Park, which is near the London Buddhist Centre. He's making a devil of a racket. And um, I was with a young friend uh, who I live with, uh, who's half Czech. He was about 25 at the time. And um, so we need, to do, we need to do something about this. But um, anyway, the, the lad on the bike, took a route off the, the sort of track I was walking down and went onto the local canal. As we end, came to the end of the sort of, um, the, the sort of road that we were walking... Right, where, where, where was I? Oh yes, this young lad on the bike. Anyway, as I was about to leave the park, he came back off the canal into the park and he came along the track, there's a sort of road really, uh, within the park very very fast people were scattering and um, there was a narrow gate through which he had to get through so I went and stood there like that <laughs> and he slowed down uh, but um, uh, as he passed through he, he glared at me and I glared back and eventually he stopped and I went over to him I'm not going to tell you what I said I'm too embarrassed to tell you but it, I used an exclusive. <laughs> uh, and uh, he, then he just went his way. Now, it was a very foolish thing to have done. And it was not a particularly skillful thing to have done either. I had to explain to my own friend that I was not proud of my behaviour. Uh, <laughs> he, he seemed rather pleased, actually. But, but um, I said, look, I, I didn't behave well there. And I reflected a lot about that, and um, it, uh, well, I, in the end, I was just talking about it with Subhuti, I went to stay with him. So I don't know, if, I'm assuming that many of you know who Subhuti is, that might be a bit too big an assumption, but um, certainly one of my contemporaries, um, very, very well known in the movement, and 
we were talking about this. I said, look, this, this is what I did. And he laughed, first of all. And I asked him a question to which I knew the answer. We, but anyway, I needed to hear someone say it. And he said, well, you know, David Mitra, you know, these habits of ours run very, very deep. You know, I, I said, look, I've been practicing Dharma for nearly 50 years, and I know I'm going to do something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, um, um, of course, I have changed in that 50 years, despite my bad behavior on that one occasion. Um, there have been other occasions, no doubt, but that was a particularly dramatic one, really, uh, and a very foolish one, because as um, one of our other friends who was standing close by, who we just met as we came out of the park, and he didn't want to get involved. He used to play rugby for England, by the way. Uh, <laughs> big guy. Uh, he said, Dedimitra, I was scared that you did that because young boys carry knives these days in London. Mm-hmm. And he said, you were safe. He wasn't going to touch you. I was going to have to, I was going to, have to tackle him. And I hadn't thought about that. I hadn't thought about that at all. Uh, so it was a very foolish thing to do. But the point about this is that um, the habits that we're trying to change run very, very deeply indeed. Um, and occasionally they just pop up like that, unexpectedly. Uh, for the most part, I seem to be not prone to that kind of rel- relapse, but occasionally it, it just happens. Uh, what happened to me on that occasion, I think, was that I got carried away by indignation, which is not a positive mental state, it's very definitely a negative one. It's a, it's a manifestation of anger. Um, so, if you're practicing the Dharma, you need to be really patient and be aware that the changes that take place uh, are subtle and they take place over a long period of time and it's very, very difficult indeed to completely eradicate these bad habits of mind that we've got. Because that, of course, had it, its, its root in my mind. I was indignant that he was doing it. I should have known better. I sort of did know better, but I just couldn't stop myself in the circumstances. Um, I allowed the, the sort of indignation to, 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 to um, take over me, really. Now, this may seem as if it's got nothing to do with talking about facing old age and, and so forth, but um, it does, actually. One of the first things that I... Well, in fact, the very first thing I realised when my GP told me that she was referring me for a suspected prostate cancer. Uh, and I knew at once from the way she was talking about it that it was pretty serious and that in her mind it wasn't suspected. She'd done this sort of thing before. Uh, she was convinced, uh, which proved to be the case. <laughs> I just spoke with her about it afterwards, uh, sometime later, after I you know, had been properly diagnosed. But, uh, and as soon as that, I was told that, I knew <coughs> that... Um, I, if I was going to get through this, um, I had to maintain positive mental states. That, and that was the challenge, to maintain, to maintain skillful mental states. Because if I, want, if, if I just once gave way uh, to fear, anxiety, and all the host of emotions that you might expect to come up with a diagnosis like that, um, it would become very, very difficult. And to my surprise, it wasn't difficult for me to do that. Um, partly because I, I sort of, uh, I was braced for it. I was, but I was, I was um, I kind of like the challenge in an odd sort of way, almost perverse, isn't it? But uh, it was a challenge to rise to. And, um, but the fact that I was able to do that was, simply, was because I'd had a lot of Dharma practice behind me. Uh, at that time I was 68, so I'd been practicing for 44, 44 years, something like that. More. Anyway, we won't get bogged down in numbers, 46, whatever, something like that. Over, well over 40 years. Um, and my Dharma practice really set me in good stead, as it would for anyone in such circumstances. But um, I find it quite liberating, oddly liberating, because, you know, if you get a serious diagnosis like that, um, well, your own mortality is right in your face. It's not just something that you understand theoretically. It's something that cuts really deep. Um, 
it's like you feel under threat. Um, and uh, that was a very, very positive experience for me. Um, and it relates with something else which I, I like to talk about when I get the opportunity, which is that I saw it as an opportunity to meet new experience. I think it's really important to remain open to new experience. And usually what that means in a spiritual context, let's say on the Buddhist context, is being open to unpleasant experience. Because they're the kind of experiences that we don't want to have. And we certainly don't want to have a cancer. And I hope that none of you get one. But statistically, the odds against you, I'm afraid, um, more and more cancer is, going to, is becoming a problem in, our, in the society. So many people nowadays are going to have to face this sort of the, the, the fact of being given a, a cancer diagnosis. Uh, maybe some of you have already been there. But um, the best way to deal with that, or the best way of um, approaching it, is to have a solid foundation in Dharma practice, by which I mean positive emotion especially, but also mindfulness. Um, I, when, I, when, I was, when I was going through chemotherapy at the LBC, well, I, was, I, I was still at the LBC, I, didn't, I was being treated at a hospital in London, and, um, but I didn't stop teaching, I didn't want to stop teaching, not unless they stopped me teaching, which they didn't. <laughs> and um, uh, I remember on one occasion I gave a talk where I explored this idea of, 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 sort of the importance of being open to new experience. And it was something that I've given quite a lot of thought to over the years, but one of the things that I, I emphasised there, partly because you know, the people who go along with the LBC tend nowadays to be in their 20s and 30s. Um, uh, of course, there's a smattering of, of older people too, uh, but um, they're mostly in their 20s and 30s. And um, I said, look, you know, the, the problem with the difficulty about m maintaining an openness to new experience is that we, we like, well, really, we start to get settled in our ways. We like things to be a particular way and to remain in a particular way, which of course is absurd, because nothing remains in a particular way. Things are always changing. Um, but um, uh, the reason I'd given quite a, bit of, uh, a, a bit, quite a bit of thought to this was because I realised, I think, sometime in my um, mid-50s, I better be a bit careful about what I say here, but I, I realised I was in danger of becoming a grumpy old man. <laughs> And, you know, to become a grumpy old man is, frankly, spiritual death. You don't want to go there. Um, and so uh, I realised this partly because I was observing one or two of my contemporaries who were getting dis dis uh, dis decidedly grumpy. And I think it was to do with their age. Uh, we were pretty much the same age, um, give or take five years, let's say. But um, one of the symptoms of this grumpiness was the frequency with which there were complaints about just about everything under the sun. And that the volume of complaining seemed to be increasing. Uh, and I could see myself getting caught up in that in small ways. And I thought, no, if you go down that track, you're going to you're gonna end up like a grumpy old man. And I really didn't want that. And rather be dead, frankly. And I don't say that lightly. Um, uh, so I took a vow, and inwardly took a vow, to stop complaining about anything. I've occasionally broken that vow, but I, I don't often break it. Uh, and I also realised that this was the key to youth. Uh, so it seemed to me anyway. It's uh, one of the keys anyway. So I, I, wore, I, I said, I remember saying on this occasion at the LBC that, you know, because I'd heard Bante say, suggest something of a sort, not quite in this connection, but something similar. He said, you know, well, he, I, I was saying rather that um, once you start to get settled in your ways and you want things to remain fixed, you know, that's when your old age begins. And I think I said, I think it begins in your mid 20s, so watch out. <laughs> because, you know, by the, by the time you're in your mid 20s, we well, you know what you like and what you don't like. And more and more we become governed by what we like. And we try to avoid what we don't like. Or at least the unfamiliar. Um, we try to avoid those things which 
um, uh, are unpleasant in some way or which we, we're not sure about, we're uncertain about them. But I think it's really important at whatever age to keep that kind of openness to life. And it's vital if you want to lead a genuinely Buddhist life, I would say. Because that, it's that which helps you to change. Well, I mean, there's all sorts of things which help you to change, but I think that is a, is a key element to it. Um, so I sometimes give my young friends a bit of a ticking off about this. They tick me off about other things. <laughs> but uh, uh, we, keep, we keep one another on our toes. Um, but that kind of attitude was important, very important to me at that stage of my life because for the first time I was having to face a very serious illness which could kill me. Um, I was faced with that sort of, um, uh, well, that, that awareness, very strong awareness of my own impending mortality. Um, and for quite a while I had to deal with a lot of uncertainty because for about the first 11 weeks after I'd seen my GP, it was uncertain whether or not my cancer had spread. Um, and of course, you know, if, if, your cancer, if your cancer had spread, it's a whole different ball game. Um, but it hadn't at that time spread, so uh, I had a chance of a cure. But living through those 11 week, that 11 week period was really quite remar remarkable for me because I felt vividly alive. And I felt in particular um, very, very aware of the surrounding beauty of the environment in which I lived in, in Bethlehem Green. Not quite as beautiful as Shrewsbury. Um, but uh, you can see beauty in just about anything if you look at it. Well, if you look at it from a certain, well, in a certain frame of mind, let's say. And this is one of the things that I greatly valued from that period of life, of my life. And... That sort of continued throughout my treatments, but it wasn't so easy to sustain because it's very difficult to live life at that level of intensity all the time. It's probably impossible, but nonetheless it leaves an indelible mark upon you, something that you're not going to forget easily. Um, and, and I particularly enjoyed the, the deeper appreciation of beauty. Um, I live at the London Buddhist Centre, above the centre, in one of the communities, and I live on the back of the building, thank goodness. <laughs> but uh, it's not a pretty sight out there. Um, but for quite a lot, for months, the, very often it was the only view that I had from my window, and it looked out over um, not the most inspiring view, but on, nonetheless, within my, within my purview, there were three trees that I could see. And I frequently looked at them. I looked at them um, different times of day, in different light. I looked at them, through, I followed them through, through three seasons, from winter through to autumn. So I saw all the changes that the, changing, the shifting of the seasons brought about. The sh all the changes that the shifting weather or light brought about. Uh, and I really felt that I knew those trees and I really learned to love them. And they became increasingly important to me, increasingly beautiful to me. Um, and I've never lost that feeling for those trees. Uh, and that's all because of the cancer. It would not have, not have happened otherwise. So in many ways, I was grateful for what the cancer had brought to me. Um, more recently, my cancer has recurred and it has actually metastasized, which means that it's only a matter of time now before it spreads throughout my body and knocks me off my perch. But, you know, I'm 74. I've got no great ambitions to live well into my 80s. I'm almost, I'm almost certainly not going to make them now. Uh, I'm not too fussed about that. Um, uh, my body is ailing quite sufficiently at 74, especially through a lot of the um, side effects from the cancer treatments, but not just those. So you, you gain a different perspective on these things. I mean, I don't believe in life at any cost. I don't think I ever have felt that, actually, but not, certainly not since I became a Buddhist, but I feel that even more now. Um, and so, you know, um, there was a period of uncertainty again when I, I knew my oncologist was concerned about the level at which my cancer marker was going up. I knew this for several months, but um, 
it was very different from the first time around insofar as um, I felt less affected by the uncertainty. I felt that, um, uh, well, I, I mean, I dealt with very well, I thought, with the uncertainty in the first instance, but this time it had a different sort of flavour to it. Um, and um, I understood then that I'd learned to deal with uncertainty even more. Um, and, and, and also kind of enjoy it in a way. It, it gives you a certain edge to your experience. But uncertainty is something which people find extremely difficult to handle. And I certainly did when I was young. And one of my young community members was in quite a sort of tiz really recently because he knew there's a possibility that he might be invited to the men's ordination course this year. Um, but, but, and he knew that I knew whether he was going or not. <laughs> and um, there were reasons with, for, for which I, I just couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't tell him that at the time. It was complex, I can't really go, I didn't, I didn't like the fact that I couldn't tell him by the way. But um, I couldn't for about a week. And he told me he was finding it very difficult not knowing. He said, I don't mind if I don't go. But not knowing is what I find really difficult. Um, uncertainty, in other words. And yet, that's the stuff of life. The sansara is just uncertainty writ large. Uh, so you have to come to terms with it somehow. Nothing's, nothing is predictable, as we know, according to the Buddhist tradition, except the fact that one day you will die. That's all that's certain. Um, and I was talking about this... Uh, when I, I talked about this quite a bit in the launch I give, gave in, in, in uh, um, Cambridge recently and got to speak with someone after the, you know, after, after I finished and well, at the end, when I was signing books and so forth and he just asked me, he said, look, would you like to come and talk to my firm about this? He said, I really like what you said about uncertainty. I said, well, yeah, I'd be very happy, but what's the reason? He said, well, uh, well people are very, very... Um, people in the office that I work in, people are very, very uh, unsettled by the fact that people are, you know, people are always coming and going. They get used to some one, one person in the office and then they move on and you know, there's no stability basically. So I agreed to go. It turns out to be a, one of those multinationals. So <laughs> I'm going to have a very, very, very um, interesting uh, promotional visit there. Uh, but um, um, the fact is that uncertainty is the nature of life. Uh, it's never been predictable. Um, most of it, well, there's very little that we can control in our lives. Not saying there's nothing, but most of it we can't control. Uh, so it's something that we really have to learn to, to deal with. Um, and it's one of the issues that I have addressed in my book. So I'm just going to bring it to your attention now. This is the book. I've seen it's probably on sale there now. Entertaining Cancer, The Buddhist Way. I gave my co a copy to my oncologist the other day, a few weeks ago, by the way, a little bit trepidatiously, because she, she kind of features rather strongly in it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when she first got the book. She was very keen, she was very keen to read it. And then uh, I told her, I didn't want to tell her actually, but she sort of, we tried to arrange various scans to, to determine whether my, you know, my cancer status and uh, I said I'm going to be travelling around a bit at the moment and might not, you know, it might be tricky to get the dates uh, organised. I said, oh, why are you travelling around? I couldn't fear. He said, well, I'm actually launching a book. Oh, what have you written about? I told her, oh, I'd love to read it. So I had to give her a copy then. Anyway, when she first got hold of it, she, uh, she sent me an email saying, got the book, uh, I'm reading it now. I didn't realise I had such a prominent part in it. Yikes! <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yes, so meet her if you read my book, if you buy my book and read it, which is what I hope some of you at least will do. Anyway, that's enough about the book uh, for the moment.